Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Timothy Lee, and I'm a mining analyst here at Red Cloud Securities. We would like to thank Pear Tree for sponsoring this session. We welcome Daniel Osterman, CEO of Flying Nickel Mining Corp. Uh, he will speak to us about Flying Nickel, a newly listed company with an established project in the Monago Nickel Project in Manitoba. Dan, you have 15 minutes, and then we'll have a five-minute Q&A at the end of the session. Attendees, please feel free to ask questions using the Q&A link below. Take it away, Dan. Thank you, Tim. And thank you, everybody, for granting an audience today. Uh, I am Dan Osterman. I, have, I am a professional geologist. I've been in the mining and exploration business for 25 years. Uh, I started my uh, career in the nickel industry and actually in the Thompson Nickel Belt where this Monago project is located. I, I helped drill the uh, T3 deposit in Thompson itself off. But I also spent a good chunk of my career in the nickel industry, probably almost half my career. I, I worked in nickel camps of uh, Thompson, of course, Sudbury, uh, Lynn Lake. I've also worked in the Western Cadillera exploring for nickel. And here I am back in the Thompson Nickel Belt, so homecoming, and i um, very happy to have the opportunity to just talk about our project today. So forward state looking statements as, as needed, safe harbor and all that. But uh, just a little bit about the project. We are, our project is located in the TNB or Thompson Nickel Belt. That is the second largest nickel camp historically in North America. They produce 5 billion pounds of nickel since the late 1950s. Uh, in terms of our project, we do have a 43101 resource, uh, which I'll go into some detail in. Uh, our project has excellent infrastructure. We're about one kilometer away from a paved highway, which is a provincial highway number six, as well as a major hydroelectric power line, 230 kilovolt power line, and there's uh, pl plenty an abundance of water. This project also has a legacy of, uh, of good work that has been done, put into this project, has been explored since the late 1960s and really uh, in, in to the current today, passing several hands, there's a, there's a swath of data and really we're just at the point where we're pushing it back to, past, the, past the finish line and we've really built on all that previous good work that has been done on this project to date. Oops. So let... Oh. Sorry. Just a little bit of glitch there. Okay. So a little bit about the resource. We do have a 43101 resource. It is a measured and indicated resource containing 722 million pounds contained nickel grading 0.7.4%. There's also an additional inferred resource of 319 pounds contained nickel of 0.74%. 84% uh, of that is located in the nose deposit, which is here on the bottom right hand corner, as you see. Now, interestingly, this project was brought to a feasibility level stud stage study in 2010 based solely on this nose deposit. In our updated mineral resource estimate that was completed in 2021, we were able to bring in this additional North Limb deposit. It's, it has a 117 million in, in indicated resource, million pounds contained, also 0.74% and 113 million pounds uh, inferred. So that is the additional material that we brought in since that has been brought in since 2010. And then there's a lot of great projects in North America right now with these open pits uh, sort of scenarios looking at nickel. And in terms of grade, we see here that our project hold, holds up very well in comparison to a lot of these projects. So a little bit about the company, as Tim had noted, we, we are just newly trading as of today. Uh, we just started trading, but we started. Or we opened today at seventy cents. I don't know what our close is. I'll check it out after this, uh, after this opportunity. But our market cap at forty-two million, sixty-two, sixty-two million shares outstanding, and 72, 73 million shares fully diluted. So, what are you getting for the your investment value here? Well, there's the resource, uh, the nickel resource, three and a half cents per pound valuation, purchase price. But also, there's that all that great work that's been done. $53 million, it would take $53 million in today's money in order to, to really recreate what has been done on this property. Uh, that includes $85 million in diamond drilling, which would be 30, oh, 80, 5,000 meters of, of, of diamond drilling, which costs $34 million to replicate. But add into that in baseline studies, et cetera, to bring it to its current stage. So just talk about the environment here. 
uh, Mon the Monago project, as it advances, and we're looking at a, 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 a near a development stage project, could potentially have the lowest CO2 emissions per pound nickel produced. Uh, this is largely because the hydroelectric power line, which is which is a kilometer away from Monago, has 0.4% CO2 emissions intensity compared to a lot of power so power sources elsewhere in the world. You can see right here compared to even other places in Canada, we have a very, even orders of magnitude lower uh, emission intensity. Uh, we are also looking at, uh, in, in, a, in an outdated feasibility study that we'll be commencing shortly, looking at an electric mine fleet option, which, which will further lower these emissions. And this is something, this is important because you, companies like Barrick and Newmont have announced net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Uh, this is a concern that, uh, so this is also an investor-driven push for climate change initiatives. And just in terms of the supply chain in the EV battery space, uh, there really needs to be a lower, from the entire chain, there has to be low CO2 emissions. And sulfide nickel is very special in this regard compared to laterites. We're looking at orders of magnitude lower compared to uh, salt laterite nickel and so on and so forth. So that's a consideration going forward. Plus obviously government policy changes are, dri are driving towards these initiatives as well. A little bit about the team. There's myself, which whom I've already spoke about. Uh, Rob Van Drunen is our, our chief operating officer. He has over 30 years experience so that, uh, as operational experience. He's optimized mine operations, supply chain. He has brought several mines in, in, uh, in Thompson into an operational status, both underground and open pit. Doug Ramsey has over 40 years experience, half of which he spent in Manitoba, province of Manitoba, and uh, permitting mines throughout Canada, but also working with the First Nations in various areas throughout Canada. Mark Scott was 20 years with, as the in, in Valet. He's the former head of the Manitoba operations. And Dave Gower is over 20 years experience. He's a professional geologist uh, and, but he's worked for Falcon Bridge and, and, and other uh, global nickel uh, projects. So going down into the, going, going down in the resource a little bit here, uh, of the 85,000 meters of drilling, most of it has been in the, in the nose deposit, 71,000 meters of drilling, which means we have very good understanding of the geotech and, and the continuity of the mineralization and here, but there's also the remaining 14,000 meters is the North Limb Zone. So we see the North Limb Zone as an area in the future that we can move, move into the measured and indicated status. And, and that will, of course, maybe look, and then of course, look into a mining scenario with those uh, elements of the project as well. Uh, we are looking at an open pit project and really that's because the nature and geology of the nose deposit, very continuous mineralization, for example, 192 meters of 0.51% nickel is, is, is sort of a typical style, typical intersection that we might see and very monolithic, which is lends itself to that uh, open pit style uh, mining method. This is a Thompson nickel belt style deposit and why that is important because uh, metallurgy, of course, predictability and repeatability and, uh, and, and, and also in terms of exploration. Uh, to the left here, we have what is called the Thompson Dome and it occurs on a, on a fold structure and the, and the T1 deposit, which is the first mine that was ever mined in Thompson, occurs on the nose of this geological structure. And across, along the limb of that structure is the T3 deposit, just several kilometers. So that, those structural uh, elements are very important from an exploration perspective. And how does is Monago measure up? Well, it's exactly the same sort of geological phenomenon, remobilization of, uh, of uh, mineralization into the fold nose, hence the nose deposit. And then following along the limb of the same structure, you have our north limb uh, deposit. Uh, these map very well on our geomagnetics, geophysical methods, and the, they really, uh, this could really be considered hot spots on a heat map where you see uh, these ultramafic bodies that host this mineralization light up. There's additional potential in the area, uh, drill defined potential. I might, I might add about two and a half kilometers to the Northwest. There were some of these mag highs that have been tested. They hit in 2008, 66 meters of 0.52% nickel and about five kilometers south on one of our mineral leases. There have been in the 70s, there were seven hole, six holes drilled. All of them hit nickel mineralization, 
best of which 37 meters at 0.51% nickel. And note, this, note the scale here. This is about a two kilometer uh, mineralized body or potentially mineralized body uh, when, where that's a hit. So that's a big time uh, uh, upside, potential upside. And again, note they were drilling hot spots in the, in the area. And there's a number, a lot of other targets in the area where we might have targets that we can follow up on in the future. And we've been focusing primarily on this poster stamp area for, the, for this presentation. If you look to the far right here, you see a satellite image. Uh, we have a 197 square kilometer land package. Uh, you can see the Monaga Plaza as a red, red dot on the, on the right hand side. You can also see the proximity of the highway and the hydro line through the property. And uh, really this has been super, in the middle here, sorry, in the middle here, we've superimposed this on the mag map. And uh, you see that there's a lot of area, a lot of hot spots for us to follow up on. And that really uh, highlights the district potential for the property in terms, of, uh, in terms of blue sky potential. Getting back into uh, the product here, there were, as mentioned, this was brought to a feasibility level study in 2010. In 28, 2008, SGS Lakefield did over 60 uh, rougher and cleaner float rougher kinetic and cleaner flotation tests based on five metallurgical holes for that feasibility study. Nickel feed ranged from between 0.4 to 0.6, and they were able to recover a very good uh, concentrate of 22%, or eight, the range was 18 to 34, but 22% average, and that was using a 0.43% uh, feed. You can see with our resource, we have a 0.74% uh, nickel grade, so uh, recovery increases steadily with grade, so we might even get better recovery as we go forward. This is Thompson style mineralization, low deleterious elements, but also, but another reason this is important because in terms of the flow sheet, there's nothing new under the sun. We're not doing any new technology. We'll use the same similar flow sheet as we as being used in Thompson, and that is the flow sheet design that was put forth in the 2010 feasibility study. And there may be some improvements we can look at uh, when we update the feasibility study, but at this time, we're very confident that, that these, these uh, recoveries can be achieved system, uh, consistently. So where would it go? Well, it's a question we get, so we, we address it. Well, Thompson is just 225 kilometers to the northwest. The Ortrex literally drive past that highway, that uh, the Highway 6, and go, they go down to Winnipeg and go down to Sudbury. Sudbury itself, in terms of the valet smelter, I have a are under capacity at this time, and they are looking to, for more material to supplement the declining uh, nickel. They are not bringing any more nickel uh, ore bodies, no more, any more nickel mines, sorry, online at this time. So they're looking for spare capacity. So there, there are 60 kilotons under capacity. Similar to the Glencore capacity, there are 35 kilotons under capacity. But there are other options in two. There's the, the, there's a long har the Long Harbor the, or the uh, uh, in Newfoundland as an option, there's share it, but we can also go, once we get it to, to Winnipeg and go by rail to the West Coast, we can also go to Odukampu, et cetera. So there are numbers, options, it costs about four, it's, it's, it's about 4% uh, of the entire cost of, the, of moving nickel. So what's our timeline look at and where are we going? Well, one of the unique element parts of this project is that this was project was actually permitted for a 10,000 ton per day operation uh, in 2011. We have confirmed with the Manitoba government that this, this mining permit essentially there or the environmental act license is still active pending the completion of a notice of alteration that moves the tailings, wet, tailings waste, rock, waste rock management facility uh, to a different location or this is a notice of alteration. We have submitted this notice of alteration and we expect by Q2, uh, I, sorry, I should have updated this, but now it's Q2 of, of this year in the next six to eight weeks that this NOA will be completed and processed, at which time we will be granted an environmental act license and we'll have a fully permitted uh, operation, uh, fully permitted project for a 10,000 ton per day operation. Another thing we're, we're doing is we just we are now just just now initiating a, an updated feasibility study to update the 2011 uh, feasibility study from historic to current. Uh, we are we have begun First Nations engagement. We've actually uh, signed an MOU with the Norway House Cree First Nation, who are the who upon whose traditional lands this project is 
is on. And we're going to be working actively with them to, to uh, have more substantive talks as well with other surrounding uh, First Nations. And we have a very strong nickel team in place. Uh, uh, as you saw with over 115 years experience from, from exploration to operational experience from, from really bringing the projects from, from the exploration stage into the into a production uh, timeline. And so we're a project right now, if, if you know, we'll have a shovel ready project by the end of the year, if, if everything goes smoothly, at which time we look at project financing, this is a project that could be shipping concentrate by the end of 2026. So just go quickly over our budget over the next year. Uh, key items would be some drilling that's currently ongoing right now, uh, but also updated metallurgy, the feasibility study, and it, overall, we're looking at a $7.2 million budget. We have that in, in the treasury. So we have enough money at this time to complete this year's work. And uh, that's it for, for uh, our project. And uh, we're trading now at the, our ticker sign is FLYN. Uh, I didn't put it in here because it is very new. So, we're, but we're, well, th that concludes it for our project. Great. Great. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the informative presentation, Dan. Um, we'll now move on to the Q&A session here. Uh, we do have a, a question or two. Um, obviously, I had mentioned some of the, the plans for some of the overburden. Obviously, there was in the past, um, there's some high quality sand that was going to be used for frac sand. Is there a plan now for, uh, for what to do with that sand? So we, we don't anticipate a plan at this time. The, the uh, pr price of frac sand at that, at that time was about $53, $53 a ton, and now it's around $20 a ton. We still will look at it in, a, in our, we'll do a marketing study and updated feasibility study. But because of the mass depression of, of, the, of that uh, L part portion of the project, we don't anticipate it's gonna be a major part of it. Uh, having said that, one of the, I mentioned the MOU with the First Nations. The First Nations have a very keen interest on moving the other part of the overburden, which is a dolomite cap over top of this, uh, which is actually over top of that science stone. This is a very high quality, high magnesium uh, limestone. It is in high demand in, in aggregate and, and in terms of uh, environmental cements and so on and so forth. So we're gonna look at a possible using, possibly using that on the pre-strip and really that that's not really part of the nickel mining story, but it will be part, it may mitigate our costs in terms of the pre-stripping costs for the project. Great, great. And um, what would the timing of that be? The, uh, or what, I guess, how much time would the pre-strip itself uh, uh, take before you would be uh, into the nickel deposit itself? It's a, it, it, once you have all the financing and let's say you get a production decision, you're looking at about two and a half years to pre-strip until you start getting your first uh, nickel concentrate. Okay, great. And um, I guess just to, to close out here, kind of a, a little open-ended question, but what, uh, what do you see as catalysts here for the company in the coming months? Sure, well, uh, Number one would be, of course, we are drilling on the property, so we'll probably be announcing some drill results uh, in the coming months. Uh, the other thing that we're doing on that CO on the CO2 component, on the environmental component, we're working with Scarn and Associates to get uh, some numbers on on that uh, part of it. We have we will be announcing the MOU, so that is actually going to be probably. Uh, very soon we'll, we'll, we'll announce that. That'll be a catalyst and, and it'll kick off for us meetings to further meetings to have more definitive agreements. We have put a deadline for ourselves or a goal to have those definitive agreements by the end of June. So that's a huge component for us because we don't see this project moving forward without uh, First Nations cooperation. So that'll be another element that sort of de-risks this project. And of course, the feasibility study itself will, will be a will be finally give updated numbers, updated economics and so on and so forth and really give investors a good sense of where this project is going and, 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 and the viability of the project. Great. All right, well, thank you again, Dan, for the presentation today and thank you everyone on the line for tuning in today. Up next, we have World Copper on stream one and Valor Metals on stream two. Have a great rest of your day.